Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you with some important stuff that you really need to know about. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, any comments to make or whatever, uh, email them to me directly. This is my personal email, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or if you prefer, you can leave a, a, a comment there if you'd like. Uh, if you do email me, please, as always, include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam and be a little patient because I'm just terrible at answering email, but I do get to it and you will get an answer. All right, with that, uh, traditional introduction out of the way. I'm going to start with, as I always like to when I can, a couple of bits of good news this week. I'm going to start the week with some good news. Uh, first off, we've got another little bit of evidence that marriage equality will come. Now, for years, the deliciously demented Michelle Bachman uh, has been held aloft as a leader in the bigot's efforts to prevent the establishment of marriage justice. But when she was asked about the issue directly last week, she dismissed it as not an issue in the election and, in fact, called it boring. Now, she tried hard to walk that back the next day, insisting that her beliefs on the matter of, you know, marriage, one man and one woman, all the rest of that stuff, uh, hadn't changed one tiny little bit. But, of course, that wasn't the point. The point was not whether or not he, she had changed her mind about the issue personally, but whether or not she thought it was a campaign issue that the right wing should continue to press or whether it would be better for them to leave it alone because, you know, it's boring and stuff. Apparently, she's among those who Brian Fisher, the wacko head of the Wacko American Family Association, describes as having sort of given up. And the more they give up, the more we can carry it on. Other other bit of good news uh, actually comes out of some not good news from an unsurprising source, the White House, where President Hopi Changey proved once again that he's a gutless wonder when he has to deal with opponents that he can't hit with drones. Obama had, t had promised to take executive action on immigration reform, but then, just as he has done on other issues, think Keystone XL Pipeline, uh, he crumpled in the face of right-wing grumbling and decided to put off a decision until after the November elections, at which point he'll be able to judge how politically safe it is for him for the remainder of his term in office. Well, the good news here is that in the face of this failure, others are stepping up. Specifically, churches in Illinois, Colorado, Arizona, Pennsylvania, other places um, are stepping up. At least 40 churches are now offering sanctuary to specified undocumented immigrants, some of whom have been living in the U.S. for 10 years or more, but who now face imminent deportation. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, appropriately acronymed ICE, uh, has a policy against uh, arresting undocumented immigrants at, quote, sensitive locations such as schools and churches, unless there's some specific release, uh, reason uh, related to a violation of criminal law. But even so, even despite that policy, there was still some risk to the churches in doing this because uh, if ICE decides at some point that the heck with the rules, we're going to crack down, uh, some church members, at least hypothetically, could be charged with harboring a fugitive. Still, Reverend Julian de Chazier, who is a minister of one of the churches involved, said this, the church has a responsibility to the law when the law is moral and upholds human dignity. When it is not, we have a responsibility to call attention to that. And it's good news that there are still people who are willing to say and do exactly that. All right, next up this week, we have two quick updates. Back at the end of May, I gave the Clown Award to one Michael Boggs, who had been nominated by the amazing Mr. O to the federal court in Georgia, despite a record as a Georgia legislator that include opposition to LGBT rights, civil rights, and the right to choose, among other things. Well, the update is that last week, 
Senator Patrick Leahy, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, said that there's not enough support among Democrats on the committee to move Boggs' nomination forward. According to Leahy, Boggs just doesn't have the votes, which means that there actually can be something that's too much to swallow, even for the Obama bots. And our other update involves the Air Force. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, in the outrage of the week, uh, it involved the refusal of the United States Air Force to accept the reenlistment of an airman because he's an atheist who didn't want to have to recite the phrase, so help me God, in the enlistment oath. Now, saying that phrase previously had been voluntary, but during his first term in, in the Air Force, the Air Force had made it mandatory. The update uh, here, and it's also this is also good news here too, uh, the update is that soon thereafter, under a threat of a suit from the American Humanist Association, the Air Force re-reversed itself and went back to the old rule of the phrase being optional. All right, from there, we're going to move on to one of our regular weekly features. It's the outrage of the week. On September 29th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made his speech to the UN General Assembly and to show just how seriously he takes the occasion and how seriously he takes the United Nations. For the second year in a row, he turned up after the event was mostly over and most of the world leaders had given their speeches and already left. The speech itself that he gave was described by Barack Ravid of the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz as a tour de force of deja vu. Uh, quoting Ravid, the sound bites and arguments Netanyahu used on Monday have appeared in each of his General Assembly addresses over the last five years. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, Tel Shalev of I-24 News went down a sort of checklist going, prop, check. Analogies, check. Rhetorical questions, check. Pop culture references, check. Quote from, from Isaiah, check. Meanwhile, most U.S. news accounts, as is typical, um, consisted for the most part of pull quotes from Netanyahu's speech with little, if any, analysis and most of that quite shallow. But this, this is the reason that his speech is the outrage of the week and it's something that was barely noticed in any of the mainstream news coverage. In his speech, Netanyahu never mentioned Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Now, I didn't watch the speech, so I can't be sure, but based on what was in news reports, it appears he never mentioned the West Bank. In fact, he never mentioned the Palestinians at all, except to condemn Hamas. Instead, he called for an updated template for peace in the Middle East one based on making regional alliances with Egypt, Jordan, Abu Dhabi, and Saudi Arabia, and an update of the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative, quote, according to current realities, unquote. All right, what sort of realities is he talking about? Well, here's one. This is how we think of the West Bank. This is the reality of the West Bank. The areas in yellow are the only parts of the West Bank that are actually under the control of the Palestinian Authority. The areas that are sort of brownish have Palestinian Authority civil control, but the Israeli military is still in control there. And the pale blue areas, it's all Israel. Israel civil, Israel military control. And the blue dots there, those are Jewish settlements. In other words, what Netanyahu wants, what Netanyahu wants is current realities. He wants to go back to the realities that existed before 1970 when the aspirations of the Palestinians didn't figure in the discussions at all. This is not just throwing a two-state solution. This is not just throwing the idea of a Palestinian state. This is not just throwing that under the bus. This is treating it as if the whole idea never even existed. I said before that Benjamin Netanyahu does not want peace. Now he's not really even trying to hide it anymore. The whole West Bank being part of Israel and filled with Jewish settlements. The Palestinians subjugated, Hamas destroyed. That is Benjamin Netanyahu's template for peace. One we as Americans are being expected to underwrite to the tune of over $3 billion in military aid each and every year. It is, to say the very least, an outrage.
Let's take a break. Here we are back. Uh, for most of the rest of the show, this is something I want to talk about here because this, this is important. It's something I've talked about before, uh, and it's in the news again. Uh, specifically, efforts by states to restrict the right to vote. Or more specifically, efforts by the right wing to keep certain types of people from voting. People like the poor, minorities, students, uh, people they think won't vote for them, so they'd be just as happy if those people couldn't vote at all. In fact, I've been talking for more than six years, I've been talking about the right wing's use of bogus claims of voter fraud as an excuse to restrict the ability of certain disfavored groups of people from voting. So how rare is voter fraud? How, just how bogus are these claims of voter fraud? All right, well, actual voter fraud means like, you know, trying to vote when you know that you can't vote or trying to vote more than once in an election when you know you can't do that. You know, actual voter fraud is vanishingly rare. It's almost non-existent. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, which actually studies voting rights and voting issues, uh, voter fraud is measured in a tiny fraction of a percent of votes. And by tiny, I mean a, a few thousandths of one percent or less. For example, a Department of Justice study of federal elections in the period 2002 to 2005 found just 26 cases of convictions for any sort of voter fraud out of 197 million votes cast. That's a fraud rate of 0.000013%, just over one one hundred thousandth of one percent. More recently, in August, uh, Justin Levitt, he's a professor at the Loyola uh, University Law School, he described how for years he has been tracking cases of alleged voter fraud. Uh, and this is in general, primary, special, and municipal elections all across the country, all levels. And he had found since 2000 uh, some 31 different incidents of credible accusations of voter fraud out of more than one billion ballots cast in that time. That's a fraud rate of 0.000031%, three millionths of one percent. And that's assuming all 31 of those cases are actual fraud. Meanwhile, in just four states that have held just a few elections under their own restrictive voter ID laws, more than 3,000 votes in general elections alone have been affirmatively rejected because of lack of whatever kind of ID these states are demanding, which of course doesn't include voters who don't have the ID but so just never showed up because they knew they wouldn't be allowed to vote anyway. Basically it means no fraud prevented thousands of legitimate voters turned away. In fact, the evidence for, vast, uh, for massive voter fraud is so embarrassingly scant that the right wing has started to, uh, uh, to float an entirely different excuse. It's not about fraud. No, no, no. It's about consistency and fairness and uniformity. And yet somehow these entirely different issues, the enti these entirely different concerns, gasp, what a surprise, require exactly the same sort of fixes and reforms that have the same sort of impacts on poor and minority voters. And if you don't believe this is part of a conscious strategy on the part of our homegrown reactionaries to try to fix the election system uh, so that it permanently tilts in their direction, consider this. In the five years preceding the 2012 election, almost half of states enacted some form of legislation restricting voter access to the voting booth, such as requiring photo identification at the polls, proof of citizenship to vote, more stringently regulation, regulation of uh, voter registration drives, shortening early voting periods, repealing same-day voter registration, or other methods that have the greatest impact on the poor and minorities, the very people the right wing wishes it could keep from voting altogether. To cite just one example, 
A study by the Brennan Center a few years ago found that about 7%, about 13 million American adults, do not have ready access to the sort of citizenship papers that these restrictive laws are demanding in order to register to vote. That's a burden that falls especially hard on the poor because while 7% of all American adults lack this access, 12% of poor adults do, poor being defined as earning less than $25,000 a year. And because of that, even if some of these poor people do have access to those documents, the, the financial burden of actually obtaining them and getting them can be prohibitive. Now, meanwhile, by the way, by the way, I should mention this too, less than half of voting age women in the United States who have access to a U.S. birth certificate have one with their current legal name. Women being another group, the right wing would be just happy to see couldn't vote at all. In fact, even a study that was preferred by the Conservative Heritage Foundation found that, quoting, registered voters without photo IDs tended to be female, African American, and Democrat. Uh, there's, there's a study that was done just last year, came out just la this last December. It was done by sociologist Keith Bentley and political scientist Aaron O'Brien, both of UMass Boston. Uh, th their, their, their study found that, I'm quoting them, restrictions on voting derive from both, both race and class. The more that minorities and lower income individuals in a state voted, the more likely such restrictions were to be proposed. Where minorities turned out at the polls at higher rates, the legislation was more likely enacted. Put another way, what they found was the more turnout and minority among minorities and the poor increased in the 2008 election in states controlled by the right wing, the more likely it was that those states passed restrictions on voting in time for the 2012 elections. Ultimately, this is quoting the re researchers again, ultimately, recently enacted restrictions on voter access have not only a predictable partisan pattern, but also an uncomfortable relationship to the political activism of blacks and the poor. All the talk about massive voter fraud is bogus. It is a lie being consciously and deliberately spread by the right wing for the conscious and deliberate purpose of making it harder for groups such as minorities and the poor, along with women and students, to vote. And the right wing knows this. They know this. They don't even hide the fact when they're talking to each other. Uh, Several years ago, Paul Weirich, he was the founder of the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, which is a group that has been pushing these laws at state legislature. Several years ago, at a convention of evangelical Republicans, he said, and I'm quoting him, I don't want everybody to vote. As a matter of fact, our, that is the reactionaries, leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Now, for a time this spring, it looked as though the effort had reached its apogee. It was beginning to, beginning to fade some. In April, uh, federal court struck down the Wisconsin voter ID law, and Governor Scott Walker over you, who had threatened to call a special session to revise the law to get around a, an expected adverse decision, was forced to admit he could do that in time for the 2014 election. In May, Pennsylvania announced it was giving up. It wasn't going to appeal a state court decision from January, which struck down its own voter ID law. Also in May, the, uh, the Gopper Attorney General of Iowa was forced to admit that after spending $250,000 and two years trying to find proof of massive voter fraud to justify voter restrictions, had come up with just 27 voters charged with voter fraud, none of them for voter impersonation, the only kind of photo ID would actually affect. That's 27 votes out of uh, more than 1.5 million votes cast. That's less than two one-thousandths of 1%. And then in June, a, position, uh, a petition drive in Nevada to get a voter ID uh, question on the ballot for this November stalled. It failed. But any celebration was premature. In March, a district court judge ruling said that Kansas and Arizona can force new voters to show citizenship documents when they register to vote, as opposed to signing a legal oath on the federal voter form as they'd been able to do previously. Quoting District Judge Eric Melgren, 
state election officials maintain authority to determine voter eligibility and apparently the right to be free from discriminatory requirements be damned. Quoting him again, Arizona and Kansas have established that their state laws require their election officials to assess the eligibility of voters by examining proof of their U.S. citizenship beyond a mere oath. Which uh, argument that strikes me as rather odd because in a sense he's saying that the justification for the state laws is that they're state laws. If this decision is upheld by higher courts, it would mean that residents not only in those states, but in other states with similar laws like Georgia and Alabama, would have to present something like a passport or a birth certificate, the very sort of documents that poor people and minorities are more likely to lack in order to be able to register to vote. Things like a driver's license, a college ID, or a signature given under penalty of perjury would no longer suffice. Now, in April... The Elections Department of Miami-Dade County, which is the most populous county in Florida, responded to an inquiry about if they had assessed the accessibility of polling place bathrooms uh, for those with disabilities. They responded by instituting a policy of closing all restrooms at all polling places in the county. So when you're faced with one of those six hour long wait lines like people were in 2012, make sure you're wearing your Depends. But the real reason for bringing this up now is the harsh one-two punch received by those of us who can still recall when the argument was over how we could get more people to vote, not how many hoops we could put certain groups through. The first blow came in mid-September in what was called a stunningly fast decision. The Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals reinstated Wisconsin's discriminatory voter photo ID law just hours after a three-judge panel heard oral arguments on the case. Now, this was that law that had been shot down in May. Now, the thing is, the appeals court here did not rule on the uh, law itself. It rather, it said, quoting, the state of Wisconsin may, if it wishes, enforce the photo ID requirements in this November's elections while the case continues. Yeah, yeah, if it wishes, like that was a question. So, of course, Wisconsin is doing exactly that which is causing some degree of, of anguish and chaos among local ac election officials who now have to scramble to meet the demands of this law and face the prospect of, of not only massive confusion on election day, but of figuring out what to do with the absentee ballots that were sent out under the old rules, which were in force until the Seventh Circuit decided it just couldn't wait to turn loose the forces of voter suppression. The clearest winner in this case is Governor Scott walk all over you, who's in a tight re-election race and wants every advantage he can get. But the second blow shows just how eager the right-wingers are to secure their victories as they rush to make sure their plans are in place for this fall's elections. Early in September, federal district judge Peter Economist blocked the attempt by the state of Ohio to restrict early voting. Particularly important here was the Golden Week, during which people can register to vote and vote on the same day, along with Sunday voting. On September 29th, literally just 16 hours before voting was to begin, the foul five on the Supreme Court, the disgusting denizens of the court's right-wing majority, stayed that order and let Ohio institute its cutbacks on early voting, including getting rid of Golden Week. Now remember, because this is important, it is a documented fact that minorities take more advantage of early voting than non-minorities do, which means that the more you restrict early voting, the more you restrict minority voting. That's what this is about. That's why so many of these new restrictive laws uh, look to take back the early voting that was created uh, in order to encourage people to vote and to avoid the six to eight hour long lines that people were experiencing before. And that's also why the Supreme Court, the majority of the Supreme Court, was so eager to let Ohio get on with it. The fact is, if you don't think they'll vote for them, they will try to keep you from voting at all. That's what this is about. It's about power. It's about the right wing trying to fix our election system to their own benefit. And don't you ever forget it. <laughs>
All right, that actually leads us into our other regular weekly feature and uh, how we're going to wrap up the show today. It's the Clown Award, given as always for acts of meritorious stupidity. The winner of the big red nose this week is Georgia State Senator Frank Millar. In a long-winded email, Millar ranted that uh, an appointee of Georgia Governor Nathan Deal, quote, has disappointed those of us that hoped he could bring the county together, the county in this case being DeKalb County, Georgia. The source of Millar's disappointment appears to be that DeKalb County plans to reserve Sunday, October 26th for early voting. And one of the polling places will be at South DeKalb Mall, an area which Miller whined in his email, and I'm quoting, is dominated by African-American shoppers and is near several large African-American megachurches such as New Birth Missionary Baptist. And he pledges to put a stop to this outrage of making it easier, easier for African-Americans to actually be able to vote. Although immediately afterward, he had to admit that he really couldn't do anything about it until the legislature reconvenes in January. But offering further proof that uh, foot and mouth disease extends to electronic media, Millar later defended his email on his Facebook account, saying, quoting, I would prefer more educated voters than a greater increase in the number of voters, which, if it means anything at all, means that black voters are uneducated. Georgia State Senator Frank Millar, apparently a bigot, <laughs> absolutely surely a clown. All right, that's going to be it for this week. Um, we've got other stuff that we're going to talk about in the, we in the weeks to come. I've got some really cool science stuff to talk about. I didn't talk, you'll notice, about things that I want to talk about. Uh, two very quick ones I'll mention, uh, the, 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 um, the events in Hong Kong and, uh, of course, what's going on in Iraq and Syria. Um, Part of the reason that I didn't talk too much about Hong Kong is that, again, a show like this, a weekly show, is not well suited to day-to-day -day events because whatever I tell you about could well be obsolete by the time you actually see this show. So um, I will, but I will have some overall comments on that next week. And, um, of course, again, the same is true for the stuff in Iraq um, and Syria. The only thing I will tell you about that right now is that we are being told once again to, as uh, my wife and I say, be afraid, be very afraid, that we're supposed to spend our time trembling in fear of the latest threat, threats which may or may not exist. Anyway, I'll get more into that next week. For now, you have the best week you possibly can. Peace.